Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Del Pena. I want to thank everybody for the tremendous response we got from last week's episode with the inaugural guest on the podcast, Amir Afsaluddin, the USA Under-19 Men's Selection Chairman, former USA Under-19 player, former USA Men's player. And I just want to remind everybody that not only can you watch the video version of the podcast on YouTube, but you can also get the audio version on Anchor FM, as well as Spotify, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, and Breaker. So there's plenty of options out there for listeners to access this podcast. And again, I want to thank everybody who tuned in and downloaded and is liking, sharing, subscribing to the podcast. Appreciate everybody's support for this endeavor to spread the word about all that's there in the history of American cricket. Now, on the first episode, focused on Amir Afsaluddin's experiences in and around U.S. cricket, not only as a player, but as an administrator. And one of the things that came up on the episode was during the 2004 Champions Trophy experience, USA played New Zealand and Australia in that tournament. But prior to the tournament, USA beat Zimbabwe in a warm-up match. Steve Messiah scored a century for USA. USA chased down a target of 273 with two balls to spare, Messiah again a century finished 142 not out in that match. USA winning by four wickets. But that was a warm-up match. USA's men's team has never beaten a test nation in an official match in either T20 international cricket or in one-day cricket. The only two one-dayers that USA has ever played against full members came in that 2004 Champions Trophy where they were demolished convincingly by both New Zealand and then the world champions Australia. But the USA cricket setup does have a victory against a test nation at senior level, and that achievement belongs to the USA women's team. Now, to be 100% accurate, it was a victory against a full member. First ever victory by USA against a full member nation, women's or men's cricket, to be crystal clear on this, because I know there are some women's cricket aficionados who will listen to this podcast, and they will correctly point out that test status and ODI status in women's cricket was orchestrated and awarded in a different manner to how it is done in men's cricket. Universal ODI status in women's cricket was only handed out to the full members as recently as last month, April 2021, and that includes Afghanistan. Peculiarly enough, Afghanistan doesn't even have a women's team at the moment they've never played an organized match but nonetheless they've got odi status anyway though usa does have a victory over a full member nation in women's cricket though they didn't technically have odi status at the time but zimbabwe was a full member administration collectively at the time that usa beat them that came in 2011 at the women's 50 over world cup qualifier in bangladesh it was a very very thrilling encounter usa coming out on top in the second to last over with seven balls remaining usa pulled out a one run victory clinched by a run out in the field from today's guest shibani bosker shibani has a very very interesting story to tell about her journey making it into the usa national team as a 17 year old that was her debut tour going to bangladesh in november 2011 In what was a very, very famous and historic victory for USA, she played a starring role. Not only did she have that run out, but she top scored in the first innings for USA, scoring 72, and wound up as the leading scorer on that tour for USA as a 17-year-old. And not only was it a great achievement for the youngest player on the team as a teenager to perform so well, but it's also a feather in the cap of anyone who looks toward grooming talent that's American born Shabani, just like Amir Afsaluddin, born in Illinois and was born to a mother who was American, born and raised of Indian descent, and her father who's worked as a diplomat in American embassies around the world. So she's got quite an extensive family history in the U.S., but also her life's journey has taken her all around the world to a lot of very, very interesting places that helped shape her cricket journey. And she's going to tell us a little bit about that on this show, as well as what the future plans are 
for women's cricket with the T20 Americas qualifier coming up later this summer to be hosted by USA in September. And then the 50 over World Cup qualifier, which was pushed back from last year, is now slated to be held in December in Sri Lanka. So she's a very engaging guest. Shabani currently serves as the vice captain for the USA women's team. She's currently based in Chennai as well during the pandemic. Her father, again, is a diplomat and is working at the U.S. consulate in Chennai. So that's where the family is currently based. But she's been continuing her training despite not being able to get back to Texas for the recent women's camp due to certain travel logistical issues involved with the pandemic at the moment but she's still training hard in chennai she's looking forward to come back to the u.s later in the summer at the start of the intra-regional competition that's going to be launched in the very near future and she's got an awful lot to discuss about her career and her future plans and goals playing for usa here is shivani bosker today on the stars and stripes cricket podcast we welcome USA women's player Shabani Bosker. Shabani, welcome to the show. Hi, Peter. How are you? Thank you. Um, I'm I'm flattered and honored to be on the Stars and Stripes Cricket pod- Podcast today. Well, thank you for coming on board. Long distance podcast today. You're in uh, Chennai at the moment. Uh, I know these are interesting times, obviously a lot of concern throughout the world for what's going on, the current state of affairs in India. Uh, tell us what things have been like from your own perspective. So um, we, we've been in a fairly safe environment, me and my family. So we've been able to stay indoors as much as possible. So reducing or minimizing contact with um, as, as many people as possible. So we're just staying in and staying at home. We're able to telework and all of that. So we haven't come in contact with too many people and that has really helped um, none of us have gotten sick um, we've also got our first doses of the vaccine so um, but it's been a challenge because of course um, last year we were supposed to have the 50 over qualifier and then we were supposed to have a lot quite quite a bit of cricket which hasn't happened of course and uh, it got postponed to this year and then it's been further postponed to December and um, it's just it's a little challenging to not be playing or not be able to go outdoors much because now, now there are like lockdown restrictions coming into place. The grounds are closed, camps are closed, and um, yeah, so we're just, uh, I guess, staying at home and hunkering down. No, it's yeah, it's definitely been challenging in a lot of ways for a lot of a lot of people. Now, yeah. you are the third. American-born woman to play for USA. Wow. Sandra, Sandra Ibarra and Erica Rendler beat you to the punch in, in that <laughs> regard. But you made your debut in November of 2011 in Bangladesh right. at the 50-over yeah. Women's World Cup qualifier against South Africa. Yes. And... Just read off some of the names from, from the scorecard from that match that are uh, well-known names. Donovan Nykirk, yes. Trish uh, Ch- Chetty, Marizan Cap. I mean, you, you played against some, some quite big names in that event. Uh, as a 17-year-old at the time, making your debut, the youngest player in the, the USA women's squad. Uh, what was that experience like for you? That was an amazing experience, Uh, not just as a 17-year-old, but any cricketer to play at an international event, an ICC event, uh, a World Cup event. It was the global qualifier. To be able to represent your country uh, on a world stage is is an amazing feeling. It's an honor. And to be able to do that as as a 17-year-old was also very, uh, very, it was was a great experience. So playing against South Africa, a full member nation, and... um, I still remember um, Muslin Daniels was bowling, and I hit I hit a back foot cover drive, uh, and it went for four. And then um, the next ball, she pitched up, and I drove it through mid off for another boundary. And that was like, okay, I can actually like play at this level. Kind of that was that was the realization that I had in that in that moment when that happened, and it was just. Also to share the field with um, 
you mentioned Erica and so many others, um, and Robin Singh was the coach at the time. Our our captain was Doris Francis. Um, all of them. I, I was kind of the baby of the team, as you said. I was 17, and I think um, the next youngest person was six years my elder. But um, yeah, they really took really good good care of me. But just to be able to play in that event with ten. Uh, with nine other teams. There were ten teams there. Um, Pakistan was there. Sri Lanka was there. And uh, this, that experience, I think, really um, changed the way um, I viewed cricket after that. Or um, just, It was amazing. You played against uh, a few other Test Nations in that tournament. You played against Sri Lanka. You played against the host, Bangladesh. You also played against the Netherlands. But... I think the match that you're best remembered for, the most famous sequence in that event, was the game against Zimbabwe, which yes. is a very, very famous match for American cricket. You top scored with 72. You came in at number three, top scored with 72 in a total of 188 for eight. And then Zimbabwe was close to chasing it down, got down to... The final overs didn't even get to the final over because you intervened with a very, very dramatic run out to clinch a one run win from memory. The match was streamed. This was also very special because women's cricket is so, at that point in time, was very, very rarely uh, televised, not a lot of events, especially for an associate team. And yet, USA's match was streamed worldwide. And in the 49th over, there was. The two tail enders at the crease, yeah. and I believe from memory there was a ball that was kind of nudged into the covers, and you were on the scene. To just relive that experience for us and, and tell us how you remember it. Yes, yeah, so um, I believe they had seven balls left, and they uh, needed two runs to win, and it was the last wicket, and. Um, the batter on the non-strikers end, she was actually uh, doing quite well. She was scoring some runs, and we thought, I guess the feeling was uh, they had seven balls, that they, they were so close to winning. And um, But then the previous ball, um, the batter hit to me. I was standing at extra cover, and um, she hit the ball to me, and they didn't take a single. And then that ball, she hit it again straight to me, and they took off. And then um, I wasn't really thinking. I was just like, okay, I have to get to the ball as quickly as possible, pick it up, and throw it in. And um, from extra cover, you can see about two and a half stumps. And um, I hit I hit a direct hit, one bounce, uh, and the ball hit the stumps at the striker's end. And and all of us all of us were just looking at the square leg umpire. And um, the umpire really took their time and was just like, okay. And then of course there aren't video replays and stuff like that. But then it just seemed like the umpire's finger went up in slow motion to uh, indicate that the batter was run out. But um, in that moment, there was it was everyone was so excited. All of us were jumping, and there's like this huge like yes kind of feeling. Um, and uh, we couldn't believe it, but neither could Zimbabwe because uh, they were play they were playing well uh, up to that point. And then I think maybe they just panicked a little and took that run and. Um, yeah, years of training came into that um, moment, I guess. A lot of, um, oh, sorry. Um, my, my, dad, my dad just walked in. <laughs> <laughs> Your famous dad. My yes. my favorite dad. My favorite dad of any American cricket dad anywhere in the world. Bosker. <laughs> oh, he can't hear you since I have my headphones on. But <laughs> He's a fascinating guy. You know, Tell us about him uh, and his influence, because I, I think one of the things I find um, so fun about about you and your family is the fact that uh, the traditional stereotype for Asian families is academics, academics, school, 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 school. And I remember one of the first times I met him, it might have been in Philadelphia at the uh, Marion Cricket Club when the MCC toured and you guys uh, played there in 2016. Yeah. And um, I was chatting to him, talking about you, asking how how you got into cricket and 
what level of support he gave and was there any pressure from from him or what, what he thought about uh, you playing compared to focusing more on academics and he said academics why would I want her to do that like she's doing something amazing playing sports like this is awesome like who wouldn't want to have a daughter playing cricket for a national team like why would I discourage that and he, he was he just went on about that I think he, he told me about how he formerly was a track runner a track and field athlete so he had that experience in his life growing up and he wanted that for you um so what what was the kind of support structure like for you growing up from your dad and, and from your mom and the rest of your family so um it's, it's always been balancing both academics as well as sports so we've grown up i have two sisters so my elder sister was a, a rower so she was in crew and then uh, my younger sister played uh, she played some football and uh, play some golf as well and um, she's into singing and uh, other extracurriculars as well but it's always been about being um, an all-rounder not just in cricket but um, also in um, in life but um, academics is like my, my mom's rule was um, as long as you're doing well in academics you can continue to play sports and uh, like kind of excel um, in at, at both really and as, as far as we can go in sport as well. So uh, we grew up playing all different sports. So uh, we started with like yoga, running, um, or like athletics, swimming, and martial arts. And then we also played, uh, being in the American school system or the international school system, we also had, um, of course, PE. And so we did, we, we played basketball and soccer, and we learned all different sports in school. And that really, I think, gave us a very good athletic base um, to go into um any sport in terms of whatever we had aptitude for and uh, I had the opportunities to play cricket and it kind of took off and there's always a lot of support there still continues to be a lot of support um, from my parents and my family so like my 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 father will still run with me and um, he's still kind of my my coach because we've moved around a lot and I've had a lot of different coaches but he's been that constant and so um, yeah we're always analyzing games together whether it's it's IPL or World Cup or um, international series, or it's my game, and we're um, going into tournament play and stuff like that. So it's, and then um, all the support on the home front as well. My mom does a lot as well, um, ensuring you know the diet and the nutrition is there, and making sure I'm getting enough sleep and stuff like that. So it's a it's a real team effort. One of the things you just touched on there was the fact that you moved around a lot. So for people who do, who may not be aware. Uh, your father, or perhaps both your parents, I'm not uh, exactly sure if you can clarify, uh, served as diplomats, or he served as a diplomat. And so uh, you've moved around quite a lot in the world. I know you, I believe you lived in Switzerland, you lived in Uganda, you lived in uh, Bangladesh, I believe, as well, in India. You're born in Chicago, you're born in, yeah, born in Illinois, born in Chicago. Born in Illinois <laughs> yeah. but um, you've moved around quite a bit. And you've had some interesting life experiences from that standpoint. So where are all the places that you've been in the world? And, and I guess, which one was the most interesting for you to live in, cricket or non-cricket-wise? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, as you said, my dad is uh, with the American Foreign Service. So he's a U.S. diplomat uh, posted abroad. So we've had the opportunity to live in Germany and then in Bangladesh. Interestingly, Bangladesh is where I kind of started playing cricket. Uh, when I was like nine years old and then my international debut was also in Bangladesh so that was actually uh, <laughs> quite ironic. <laughs> it was a good coincidence I guess. And then we lived in Kalk uh, Kolkata, Mumbai and Chennai in India and then also Uganda. Um, I've also been in Australia and New Zealand for a couple of months just uh, playing cricket there, not um, my dad serving there but uh, I think a very unique experience was Uganda. It's just, um, it was very different. We didn't know what to expect, and it was actually really, really nice. The weather is amazing, um, and the people are, are so hospitable and very, very kind and very modest. And it was it was a great experience being uh, visiting as well as living there. And um, there, there isn't a lot of cricket, but um, there there is a cr uh, cricket ground, and of course Uganda has a cricket team, but they're crazy about their soccer, so... <laughs> 
but it was it was really nice. Of the places that I've toured covering USA national teams around the world, Uganda is right up there amongst my, my favorite destinations. Yeah. Just like you said, the people there, the hospitality was incredible. The Just the warmth, the enthusiasm for cricket. I know cricket isn't necessarily a popular sport there, but it compared to, say, soccer or football, but the enthusiasm within the, the, the cricket community was remarkable. And even though the, the facilities they had were were limited in some ways, I would also argue that their facilities for cricket, the turf wicket facilities, could easily be claimed to be better than what's available in America. Uh, Gugogo Lobo, which is in uh, downtown Kampala, basically, but then also in Tebe, which is a bit further south towards the airport, you've got not just the magnificent cricket ground there, which is very, very nice, but it's right next to a golf course, around a golf course. So they've got some really, really gorgeous facilities. And I know you are also a very competitive golfer uh, in your in your lifetime. So what can you tell us about, I guess, that experience in, in playing uh, golf or, or just competing in sports in, in Uganda? Um, yeah, so um, I we were in Uganda and there was the Entebbe Open. So uh, you rightly said that that Entebbe cricket ground, um, around it you have a couple of the holes of the Entebbe golf course. And uh, so that's when I saw the Entebbe cricket ground uh, when I was playing the rounds there. But uh, yeah, I competed in the Uganda uh, Ladies Open and then uh, there was also a tournament at the Entebbe golf course. And uh, I'm, I'm known to be a fairly long driver of the golf ball also. <laughs> Um, so I won. I won the longest drive competition there. Um, but uh, yeah, it was. It was. It was. It was good. Golf is very different, and I've I've played competitive um, golf in India as well, at um, different um, courses around, especially South India. And uh, it's, it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> what would you say? has been most helpful in, in terms of other sports. You, you mentioned a lot of the sports you played growing up in through the American school system and the international school system or the American school system overseas that uh, American kids get to access if, if they're living either on a military base or uh, living as, as the children of diplomats overseas. You, you mentioned golf. Um, is there any other sport that you would say cultivated skills in terms of all-around athleticism that really has contributed to your development as a cricketer? Absolutely. So um, I've played some competitive soccer or football as well. So I represented my college and I also played for a boys club when we lived in Kolkata. And um, so um, other than that, I've also played some volleyball and some basketball, but I also was a, a, a sprinter um, and when I was in school. So I did 100, 200, 400. Um, just the, the, the training that we did, whether I, uh, I was really fast or not, it's the training that we did. It really helps in cricket as well. Um, I believe that, so I was a, I was a goalkeeper or a goalie in, in soccer. So I think those skills definitely translate quite closely into cricket, especially the anticipation, um, learning how to dive. Um, even in basketball, you're always anticipating, you're, you're trying to intercept the pass. That's just like fielding. You're always trying to see where the bat batter is going to hit the ball, depending on their back lift, how high is their back lift, where is it going, or where are their feet facing, where is the feet facing, and then you can move accordingly. And that way you'll be just a split second quicker, but that is the difference between taking that catch and not being there for that catch or stopping that boundary, I, I feel. So it's also that you're constantly engaged in the game and, um, it also, I would say, develop different, uh, develops different muscle groups. So you use different muscle groups for each sport, and you don't have to specifically do fitness as such. If you're able to play different sports, um, you are going to be fairly athletic. And I think that strength that you build just by playing different sports is, is phenomenal. And you don't need to just go to a, a fitness trainer and do fitness, but you can also enjoy um, while you're getting stronger and faster and more athletic. You really touched on a few interesting points there with regards to just kind of the mental approach of s sports and an athlete in general, not just cricket. And I think that's something that's not often discussed 
in cricket in particular, there's so much focus on the technical skills and drilling and batting and bowling and, and not so much yeah. practice and fielding, but the mental awareness and, and the physical cues that are given, especially in the field, that things that happen in other sports, you didn't mention tennis in there, I don't think, and I, I played tennis growing up, but I'm sure you played tennis. Um, but, you know, one of the things you look for in tennis growing up is, and, and that I did a lot of work with when I used to do youth uh, tennis coaching, was don't wait for the ball to bounce to figure out how the ball is going to bounce off the court. You have to be reading the wrist position of the player on the other side of the court when he's hitting the ball and, and read the wrist and, and the racket and the racket face so you can tell if he's turning his wrist over and producing topspin, if they're turning the wrist the other way to undercut it to produce backspin, if they're keeping their wrist and the racket face fairly open so that you can expect a truer bounce and not as much spin, and, and obviously also the different surfaces that come into play with whether it's a hard court versus a grass court versus a clay court and the different reactions that that's going to produce. I don't often see that a lot in, in terms of cricket coaching, in terms of things like when a, a player is batting, if you're fielding it square leg or you're fielding it mid-wicket, I see a lot of players who... Rather than look at the batsman the entire time, if they're in front of the wicket, they, they look at their bowler running in, and they, they waste, I feel so much time is wasted looking at their bowler, their teammate running in, which is completely useless as far as I'm concerned, when in reality they should be focusing on the batsman because there's so many cues that you can pick up in terms of the footwork, the, the hip position, the hip rotation, uh, that... If you're on the leg side and you can see the hips opening up, that's a cue ball's to, to, to be the ball's coming to you to be heightened, to have a, a, a sense of alertness. Uh, if, the, if the hips are closed, if you're fielding on the offside and you can sense a player is kind of reaching out a bit more with the hips closed, you can expect a cut shot coming on. Or, or, if, or if they're not winding up and they're just kind of delicately playing just a dab or a late cut, again, not then expecting a the, yeah, cutting you're, you're, you're yeah. training. You're training your eye. You're training your mind to do these things. And I often um, times I, I just see a lot of junior players in particular who, um, if they're in front of the wicket, they're looking at their bowler instead of where I feel that the focus should be more on on the uh, batter. And you know, you, you look at you look at other sports. Um, you know, baseball, for example. You know, most players in the infield, they're not looking at their pitcher throwing the ball to home plate. Their, their focus is entirely on the batter the whole time. You mentioned basketball. If you're guarding somebody, there's a lot of face guarding going on. Uh, or, or football and American football, there's a lot of face guarding going on where you don't have to know where the ball is. If your back is to the quarterback or your back is to the point guard, whoever's got the ball, you can pick up a lot of cues based on the person you're guarding just by looking at their eyes, looking at their face, looking at kind of where their arms are to figure out if they're expecting the ball and then you know to, to pick your head up to turn around or to put your hands up to kind of try and disrupt the pass or whatever. Um, in your experience, have you felt like cricket coaches do an effective job of this or and have, have they contributed to your development in that in any way through, through your experiences or is this something that you felt you picked up a lot more of just in working with other sports, and you had to to just adapt naturally. Um, I think it's uh, mostly picking up from other sports when it comes to things like fielding or looking at cues uh, bat when the batter uh, is getting ready to hit the ball, looking at the cues, as you said, the feet, the hips, the hands, or how they're shaping up to hit the shot. So I think that comes more from um, just playing other sports because that's not, as you rightly said, that's not something that most coaches touch upon. Like when we do fielding practice, it's usually there's a stump and then there's a fielding coach that's hitting the ball or throwing the ball to you. But then you also know that the ball is coming to you and you know you're at a certain distance. They'll be like, okay, now we're going to do catches or now we're going to do ground fielding. Now we're going to do ground fielding with direct hits or underarms. So whereas in a game, that doesn't happen. But I also think um, one of the problems is that the way we practice in cricket. So 
uh, if you if you take soccer for example, you're mostly yes you do practice some passing or some penalty shootouts and things like that. But then you scrimmage, you play five on five, seven on seven. It's um, or, or basketball, you, you can just pay, play a pickup game, whether it's half court or full court. You just need five and five people, ten. Even if you don't have that, you can play three on three or even two on two. So it's more of a realistic situation, um, the way you practice. Whereas in cricket, you end up playing in the nets, and when you're playing in the nets, then you don't have fielders. So the fielders aren't engaged. So um, a system uh, we came up with, um, of course, and my dad's input as well, just to kind of um, get into the practice of anticipating where the batter is going to hit the ball um, is watching the bat. Well, so if I'm not bowling or, or batting and then I'm just helping um, around the nets, then uh, let's say it's my break time, then I'll just um, I'll watch the batter and depending on uh, how they're shaping up, I'll be like right, left. Or sometimes I get uh, confused with my right and left to say it, so I, I would rather show hands. So, yeah, I'm like, yeah, this is my left. Oh, no, wait, this is my right. So, But um, I would probably, like, show hands. I'll be like, okay, she's going to hit there or he's going to hit here. Or, okay, this ball's going here. You might be wrong. Uh, ten, uh, you, might, you might only get, you might start with five right and five wrong and ten, ten, ten balls. But then I think that really helps. Later, it'll be eight out of ten, and then it might be nine out of ten. You might not get 10 out of 10, but um, those nine times you'll be that much quicker to the ball and things like that. So um, as you rightly said, it's not something um, coaches uh, touch upon. And it's also just, I think, the way we practice in cricket. There isn't a lot of um, open wicket or center wicket practice that's done, at least at the junior levels, because you um, are either playing in the nets or someone is just uh, underarming or you're playing against a bowling machine or something like that. And then um, as a fielder, you, you can't pick up on those um, skills. So I think the more you play, the more you play games, that's when um, these things you pick up. So when I think that's when that uh, people say, oh, uh, you can see that he has experience or she has experience or um, that person has matured as a cricketer. But I think that's just that they've played so many games, so they've picked up on all these um, tips and tricks and cues. And so they have that experience. One of the other issues I, I see an awful lot in American cricket and American junior cricket development, and I, I guess I would say not necessarily it's exclusive to cricket, but there's been a, a shift, a trend kind of in the last generation where a lot of parents are really putting a lot of pressure on kids to pick a sport early and devote all their time to it. And you grew up this way, I grew up this way where we played as many sports as possible and to get as many experiences as possible, you're in so many different things. And, and just from a, a more of a basic standpoint, it, it, you avoid burnout. Uh, you, you get a chance to refresh and, and experience different things. And you, you're always, you were always playing something in season. It wasn't a year round thing. So if it was in winter, you would go, go outside and, and play football. And if it was indoors, yeah, you would play basketball or I played ice hockey competitively uh, and then it wasn't until the spring or the summer that you went outside and played baseball you played tennis you played golf right. you, you, played, you played other sports um, and it's, it's one of the things I, I get uh, a bit concerned by in some of my travels and experiences around the U.S. that quite a lot of kids who are being funneled into the cricket academies that have popped up around the U.S.A. When uh, I'll talk to some of the parents or talk to some of the kids and I ask them, well, you know, what other sports are you playing or, you know, what else do you do for enjoyment? And the answer from the parents of the kids, not always, but a significant portion of the time is, well, you know, we're focused on cricket, 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 cricket. What kind of question is that? You know, what a stupid question. Why would we want to spend our time playing other sports? And, you know, we're focused, you know, a, the kid is only nine or 10 years old or 11 years old and it's already, well, We've got a vision. We want him playing for USA one day. And if and if, if that's going to happen, well, Malcolm Gladwell told me 10,000 hours of practice is what's required. And so we better get a head start now. And I, there's so much that they're missing out on, I, I feel, in, in so many different respects in terms of just skills development, a lot of things to talk about with hand-eye hand coordination. But, but just um, also having fun. Playing other sports is fun. Just, the, yeah. the team aspect of, of playing team sports and, and in cricket, 
like like you said, a lot of the training at junior level is net focused, where you're very isolated. There's not a team uh, environment. There's not a team spirit. And that's missed out on an awful lot. But but just the, the social aspects of, of playing other sports in a team environment, and just having fun with it. Um, so what would you say, I guess, to to kids in this uh, situation or parents in the situation who are growing up now, knowing the experiences that you had, getting an awful lot of opportunities to play different things, what were the benefits, I guess, not just from a skill standpoint, but socially or otherwise, that you felt you gained and why you would encourage uh, parents of kids or kids themselves who are uh, at a preteen age or teenagers now um, who are getting a bit carried away thinking of the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and I'm not sure what, what kind of pot of gold they're thinking of because in U.S. cricket that pot of gold might only have a few coins in it at the moment um, but um, just you know yeah what would you say to in, in, encourage them to, to not get so Hyper focused and tunnel vision, and and the benefits that you experience from, um, like I say, not just from a, a skill standpoint, but just socially and, and other other enjoyment you got out of playing other sports, and why you think it's necessary. Yes. So um, actually, during this lockdown, um, I also started playing some uh, badminton with my friends just for fun. Uh, it was just like a like a kind of like a pickup game style, and we would just um, uh, I started playing badminton, and actually. Um, the agility required in badminton is, is, I was just blown away. I was like, wow, I really need to stretch, lunge, bend, and then it, it's a very quick game. And then the, the wrist um, is also very important. So um, I was amazed at, at um, I guess, the fitness level that, it's t that it takes to also play badminton. So um, just coming back to playing different sports, right? Uh, you learn so much just playing different sports, uh, whether it's the movement, or instead of instead of doing 20 lunges and then uh, different types of lunges, if you just go play a big game of badminton, um, you, you would have done um, the fitness for the for the number of lunges that you would do otherwise. But like as you said, the social aspect, um, you make multiple groups or circles of friends uh, as well. So um, the group that you the group of friends you would have in cricket, maybe 10 or 20 people at your academy, and then if you also go and play football uh, or soccer, and you you make you make more friends, and um, just the thought process is also different. So yes, for me, um, I started playing competitive cricket when I was 11, but at that time I was also playing soccer. I was playing I was playing golf. Um, I was also playing a little bit of tennis, and then I would play different uh, or other sports in school as well. I was also playing basketball and things like that. Um, but it also takes your mind off of just cricket. So if you're just for wh what I think uh, of, if I'm just playing cricket, is okay. I'm constantly thinking about the game, whether it's on the field or off the field. Um, after hours, once I get back from practice, I'm still analyzing the game. I'm still thinking about the game. And that is very mentally and emotionally draining as well, especially when it's when you want to play very competitively. And that is, as you say, um, most people's goals when they're when they start playing really early. It's extremely draining, not just physically but mentally as well. So, playing other games, uh, I'm just really happy to play, right? Whether it's cricket or golf or or soccer or whatever game, even if it's just doing some running with my friends or my dad or. Um, even club playing backyard cricket or table tennis. So we have a TT table at home, ping pong, uh, w which we bring out sometimes. So just being able to play different games uh, definitely helps with different skills. Some games you require the wrist, some games you require the forearm, some games are played using the shoulder. So just developing all the different muscles, which definitely helps when you want to go competitively into a specific sp any sport really. Uh, overall body development, but also just mentally, it's, I would say, like, uh, stress buster or de-stressing, especially since um, school is also so focused. So as, as a teenager or a young cricketer, you're also in school. So, And then, yes, you're playing a sport or a game, and it's cricket, but then that's also extremely competitive if you're um, looking at it from that, that standpoint. So if you're playing other games, it's going to help you but also be uh, kind of like an escape, but a healthy escape. So I, I look at 
playing different sports in that way. So having played uh, some cricket in New Zealand and Australia, they uh, a lot of the players, even if they're playing for, say, Otago or Auckland or uh, some rep, rep cricket, they do continue to play other sports as well. For example, they play cricket during the summer, and then they play netball during the winter months there. So um, that, yes, keeps them fit, also keeps them engaged, and um, I think they enjoy playing sport. And um, there, there are definitely things you learn from uh, different sports, and you can use that in whichever sport you finally pick to play. So it's been... It, that that was a good learning as well because in cricket, as you mentioned, uh, in in India especially, um, where I've played a lot of cricket, it's you specialize from like the age of like six or seven, and you're just playing cricket. But it, um, in other countries, in the West Indies as well, a lot of a lot of girls play soccer or football, and um, I think that's it's it's really important to play multiple sports, um, also to just take the pressure off of co- constantly playing the same game. Is there one sport you would pick out that if you were not a, a cricketer would be the sport you would most want to represent USA in? Um, so for a while there, I was I uh, I wanted to be a professional golfer. Yeah, that was, that was what, what, what about golf? I mean, j- just um, from a basic standpoint, you were you were just very good at it. You said you won the long drive competition and you got in there. It was was there some other reason about it that you just really got a lot of enjoyment out of it? Um, it's, a, it's, it's actually very different from cricket, right? It's a quite individualistic, and then you have the handicap system as well at the amateur level. So you're mostly just competing with yourself. So it's, it's extremely different from other sports, um, but it's also very beautiful and um, the greenery, and it's actually very calming for me personally when I go to play golf. I really enjoy that aspect of it. Um, I think I think that would that would be it. Golf. Most people in the U.S. know that you started your USA career in 2011. That wasn't officially the start of your your cricket career, though, in a, in a kind of a professional or semi-professional sense. You represented prior to that Tamil Nadu at under 19 level, starting in October of 2008. So at under 19 level. You would have been a fourteen-year-old playing for the under-19 team. Yeah, similar to the U.S. Were you the youngest player in the team at that point in time, or was there anybody younger? And and what was that experience like, getting a chance to to play for the state team at the time? I'm assuming uh, your family was living in Chennai. You're in Chennai now, but it, having moved around a lot of places, what enabled you to get an opportunity to play for the the Tamil Nadu junior team at that point in time? And and kind of what was your introduction to the state cricket like there? Yes, yeah, so, um, yeah, I was I was 13. I was turning 14 that year, um, 2008. So we had just moved to Chennai, and I went for selections. Uh, and they, uh, well, I, I was told, oh, you know, there are selections. Why don't you go try out? And I was like, okay. So I went for the selections, and then I, I was selected in the team. The, uh, this is the under-19 team. Yes, I was the youngest on uh, the under-19 team uh, at that time for Tamar Nadu. And... Um, the captain that year was MD Tirushkamani, so she's the first Indian woman cricketer to score a century in a World Cup. So she was uh, she was the under-19 captain at the time. And I also played for the senior state team that year, um, and I was 14. So, um, that, yeah, so <laughs> that was, uh, it was a good time. Um, it was a good experience. I played for Tamil Nadu for three years for the under-19. Uh, I also captained a couple of games. Uh, in the later years, um, and then I also played and captained under-16 Tamar Nadu, and then I played for the senior state, and then um, it was a really good experience. I got to play with uh, Indi- people who were, were going to play for India and who had also already played for India, um, and people who were playing um, um, zonal cricket as well, so they would represent South Zone, so eight teams make, uh, sorry, six teams make up the South Zone um, in India. So um, I also got the opportunity to play for South Zone in 2011. I was 17. So this is actually before the World Cup qualifier um, in Bangladesh. So I, I represented uh, South Zone in that tournament. Um, it, was, it was a really good experience. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, I got to also um, 
watch how other teams operate and how other captains operate also. So, uh, for example, we, we were playing against West Bengal and Jolan Goswami was there. I was 12th man. Um, so uh, I was I, I used to go on the field a lot or, and, of course, carry drinks. But um, my fielding was uh, good. So I would be 12th man. And um, so whenever anyone got hurt or had to go out, then uh, I would be on the field. But then I, I, I got to watch like Jolyn Goswami's captaincy style and um, all of that, and she was the captain of India at the time, and just the way she... Um, so I, I still vividly remember uh, one of the fielders dropped a catch at mid-wicket, and it was uh, Tirush's catch, and Tirush is one of the main batters for Tamil Nadu, and this is a, a national. Um, so she dropped the catch. Uh, Jolyn Goswami, she was standing at mid-off. She ran from mid-off to mid-wicket. She just patted that fielder um, on the back and said, what looked like, oh, it's okay. And then she went back. They ended up winning the game. Uh, but just um, the different captaincy styles uh, was interesting to see um, versus perhaps shouting at the fielder for dropping the catch or something like that or showing annoyance. Um, but but actually going up, encouraging that fielder, so it's okay, it happens, and then you keep going. So um, I think it was very good development for me as a cricketer to have played it in India uh, for those three years under, uh, so right now, uh, one of my coaches is Arti Shankaran, and she was the captain of the senior team, um, the Tamil Nadu senior team when I started playing, and now she's the coach um, as well. So, um, yeah, it's it was very, very good for me as a player, but uh, interesting learnings as well. One of the teams that you came up against, I think it was your debut actually in in the state team, not uh, the under-19s or the under-16s, but in terms of the senior uh, Tamil Nadu team, you said as a 14-year-old, as a uh, so it would have been just about two months after your 14th birthday, you played against Delhi, and... Anjum Chopra was on the other side of the field for Delhi. She she top scored in the game with 89. Welcome to the scorecard now. Uh, so seeing again somebody you know you mentioned Julian Goswami and some other players, but as a 14 year old, uh, especially in that match, I'm also looking further down the scorecard. You got to thanks for coming. <laughs> you were a 14 year old. Uh, nine players batted. You didn't even get a chance to bat. So they, they you got You got an awful lot of time to watch and learn. Yes. Uh, spending all that time that day watching and learning, seeing some of the on Jim Chopra or Tourish comedy. Um, yeah, as a 14 year old, what were the things that that stood out to you and, and were you overawed by the occasion or, or was it something that you felt like you belonged? Um, I think I did feel like I belonged. I actually I was rearing to go. I was like, I wanna bat, I wanna bat, let me bat kind of that was that was always my mindset. I was like, I want to play. So even when I was 12th man, I was like, let me field. I just, uh, I want to be amongst the action. So <laughs> I think that's always uh, been who I am. I just want to get out there and um, wh whether it's bowling or batting or fielding or even keeping, uh, I, w I want to be involved. I want to be uh, in the midst of the action. But yes, uh, watching Anjum Chopra, I still remember a couple of the cover drives that she's, uh, she hit that day. Um, they were quite amazing. And um, yeah. <laughs> I don't, um, and then we also played a couple games against Karnataka, and there's Mamta Maben, and um, Mamta Maben, of course, has um, now coached. She coached China, she coached Bangladesh, she's coached a few international teams, but she uh, is a former Indian cricketer, and um, playing against Indian legends, but also international legends of the game. It's, it's, it was, it was really, it was a big learning experience. So I was always just watching how are, how, how are the batters playing um, different styles, not just of captaincy, but also of play. So some people would hit the ball harder. Some people would um, use their hands and angles and stuff like that. So how do different batters um, use their style of play to score runs or um, either boundaries or, or uh, just uh, guiding the ball? to take more ones and twos. And then the first year I played, there was the two-day version, the longer version. There was no T20, so it was two-day cricket and one-day cricket. And then the following year, they um, they didn't have any two-day games. They only did uh, T20 and one-day games. So um, 
when the T20s came around, then I got more opportunities because I was already known as an attacking batter. So um, I got more chances to play in the T20 uh, senior team. So it was it was it was good though. You mentioned you've gotten a chance to play in Australia, New Zealand. I think you were a bit modest about that. Uh, you left out the part where you opened the batting with Susie Bates for Otago. Uh, and you also played with Lee Kasperick in that squad against a uh, Canterbury team with, with Amy Satterthwaite and Leah Tahuhu, amongst others. Um, you've, you've had an awful lot of uh, experiences just everywhere. I know you played in the West Indies competition as well for Leeward Islands, and if memory serves me right, you were the top scorer for the Leeward Islands, or one of the top scorers yeah. in that competition for them. Um, so, of all these experiences, you know, getting a chance to open the batting with Susie Bates, uh, just one of the elite players in the women's game, that came in 2016, and I believe that it would have come just after uh, the MCC tour that came through Philadelphia. Uh, and I know there's some connections that um, Julie Abbott and some of the people who are involved with U.S. cricket have with, with some players overseas, with Charlotte Edwards, Edwards with Susie Bates. Um, so what kind of influence did they have, and, and how did that opportunity come about, I guess, with Otago uh, first, especially coming after a five-year gap, just for context, for people who may not remember, U.S. after that World Cup qualifier in, in 2011, uh, there was a T20 qualifier the next year in 2012 in the Cayman Islands that you did not uh, travel to and participate in. But essentially, there was a five-year gap where you, there was no cricket for U.S. women. And so to come out of that gap and then to to get a chance to play against Charlotte Edwards in Philadelphia and to get a chance to meet her and then Susie Bates a few months later, um, for somebody who was kind of uh, in a sense of uh, limbo with not many opportunities for USA, how did how did some of these opportunities come about, and what do you remember most about kind of these interactions, especially like I said, getting to walk out to open the batting with Susie Bates? Yes, well, I although there was no um, cricket in the U.S., I, I continued to so I was in Chennai and I was in college and university here, so I was I captained the college and university team, so I continued playing some cricket. Uh, although it wasn't um, national level or international, it was uh, a, a good level of cricket. And um, so I was kind of in touch with cricket, but not, um, yeah, definitely not um, USA cricket. But um, the opportunity in New Zealand uh, came about, um, we knew someone who lived in New Zealand. Um, my parents had actually been to Dunedin um, a few years before that. And I think when I was around 15 years old, and they said, oh, you know, we do have overseas player spots. Um, I think each team has one one spot, um, each rep team. So uh, if your daughter is interested, this is when I was playing um, state-level cricket in India. And uh, so we contacted that person um, that year. And he was like, oh, I'm not there anymore, but I can put you on to uh, Mr. Bracewell. Um, who's part of Otago Cricket. So that's how that connection happened. I actually visited uh, Sydney uh, and done it in, in April that year. Um, the season started in um, September, October. So, But before that, uh, I did go to April. I went to see them. I kind of gave a, a tryout or a selection. So um, Susie, Susie was there. Uh, she saw me play, and then they're like, okay, uh, We'd like yes, if you're available, you can. You can. Uh, we'd like it. We we'd like you to come out and um, maybe play the season with us. So that's how that came about. And um, actually, one month leading up to the season in New Zealand, I also played in Sydney with Alex Blackwell's team in the Sydney uh, Club League, the University of Women's Cricket Club, and I I had a great time there as well. So. Uh, sharing the dressing room with um, Alex Blackwell was was amazing as well. Just her work ethic and the way she goes about her cricket, uh, whether it's club cricket or state cricket or international cricket, I think she treats all of the games the same way, so that that is amazing. And then I had the opportunity to open the batting with Susie, and um, I think the one thing I remember is um, we're playing, uh, we're opening the batting, and uh, I'm on the non-striker's end, 
And um, by the time I scored about four runs, she had already scored 25 runs because she just stood there and she was just smashing the ball. Well, not like smashing, but like it was beautiful to watch. They are such beautiful drives and all the balls are just going to the boundary and I'm just there. I'm just, I, I didn't really even have to move because we didn't have to run because she was just piercing the gap and all the balls are going to the boundary and I was just there uh, standing there in the non strikers and watching the ball go by like this and the ball's just flying to the boundary and uh, that was, that was I think, um, that was amazing to watch. It's it's the best seat in the house, right? For when when someone is really batting well, the best seat in the house is with the non-strikers, and and I had that opportunity, so so it's amazing. You waited all this time to drop Alex Blackwell in there, and you hit Susie Bates. If if there's a time to name drop and not be shy, you're being too modest, Shabani. This is the time to show yeah. up and tell everybody who you played with. Is there anybody <laughs> else that you're leaving out? Well, um. Uh, Claire Taylor was one uh, was our um, when I was playing for Canam. We played in the uh, Philadelphia, the International Women's Cricket Festival, and Claire Taylor uh, came out um, and she captained our team. And I had the opportunity to be her deputy, her vice captain, and that was also an amazing experience. Um, yeah, again, sharing the dressing room with the legends of the game um, and continue to like Susie is still continuing to dominate women's cricket. Um, just to see their watch their work ethic from close quarters, share the dressing room with them, and be able to talk to them or share conversation. It was it's quite. Uh, I I guess I I was in awe when I saw those drives go by. So yeah, the opportunities that I've had, I'm very grateful for, and yeah, it's been it's been a good journey so far. With the U.S. women's team. Now, I, I mentioned the five-year gap, and that was not necessarily through any fault of, of the women's players themselves. There was the USA Cricket Association going through suspension and then expulsion. I know the ICC Americas took the decision to stop the Americas qualifier because the reasoning they gave at the time was, I, I actually agreed with it. I understood the reasoning behind it. I know a lot of women's players were unhappy about it justifiably but the reasoning given at the time by the icc administrators was that in usa in canada in argentina in, in bermuda there's really not much women's cricket at the grassroots level <laughs> it's a big difference organizing an event for uh, a group of countries where the player pool is into the thousands or tens of thousands but usa at that point in time had less than 100 females playing cricket nationwide. Canada was in the same boat. Canada had less than 100 females playing nationwide. The other countries, again, the development structures weren't really there to just support a player pool where you could draw from and pick top talent. And the instructions were basically to, to go focus on your development structures. You really need to put in the effort to build up your playing numbers, and then once the playing numbers grow and, and the competitive nature comes out and you just have, just by sh a sheer numbers game, you have more players to draw from to, and to choose from, the standard of cricket will hopefully be better, and then we'll reconsider re reforming the America's qualifier, and including you in, in part of the uh, regional pathway with the other uh, four associate regions. That didn't really happen, though. Because USA Cricket, again, USA Cricket Association, USAC was being suspended and expelled, and they kicked the can down the road, and it was, we'll, we'll get to women's cricket at some point in time. And instead of heeding the ICC's message and saying, all right, we're going to focus on a national tournament structure and a local tournament structure to encourage more players, the, the 2000 and, uh, 2011, excuse me, national championship that USA Cricket organized, from memory, that was the last one. They didn't organize one in 2012, 2013, 2014. There was, there was nothing happening domestically, and it kind of backfired on the ICC with what their intentions were. And as a consequence of that, um, you know, when the ICC Americas, uh, the caretaker administration, took over from, from USA Cricket after they were expelled in 2017, and towards the tail end of that, you know, you had the MCC experience in Philadelphia in 2016, uh, they... they worked at trying to make up for that lost time but what i'm leading into is in in 2017 
in Scot Scotland, the rainy week in Sterling, uh, where not much cricket was played. And then, but but further to that, even I would say more prominently in 2019, having that experience at the qualifier in Scotland was a real eye opener to me, and I think to some other people about where things went wrong in terms of the lack of help that was provided to the women's players because on the other side of the field, starting with the uh, the warm up games, you had Thailand staring at you guys in, in back in the face. And in 2011, Thailand was basically in the, the exact same position as USA from a competitive standpoint, maybe even further behind. And yet from 2011 to 2019, Thailand had a blueprint in place and didn't sit on their hands. And they didn't use the excuse of, oh, well, you know, we're not getting as much help as some other countries. Or, you know, the funding isn't there for women's cricket, so we're just going to feel sorry for ourselves. They actually went out and did something about it proactively. And when I was watching what was going on with the USA team in Scotland on the ground, I just felt so disappointed not in the, not in the players but more in the administration that, that the fact that there was there was eight wasted years that there's nothing was done and uh i remember having a conversation with, with your dad on the boundary saying I, I felt so so badly for you that from the age of 17 to the age of 25 which should be prime years of your career basically nothing was done to build on the good foundation that you had as a 17 year old in Bangladesh to help build up the, the competitiveness of the national team and, and get more players and, and just build up the, the squad depth and squad strength. From your standpoint, I guess this is a twofold question. One, seeing Thailand across the fields in the warm up game, and, and you didn't see them over the course of the tournament because you had your own matches to play, but no, and they went to the final. They won the final. Uh, go on to Australia. They clinched a spot in qualifying. Um, what did? What lessons, I guess, did you see from the Thailand players specifically uh, in that experience that USA had playing against them in one of the warm-up matches that kind of, if anything, made you think and reflect about where where all that time went that that they they spent and and the U.S. administration didn't. And secondly, what, if anything, do you think USA administrators could have done in that lengthy time span from 2011 to 2019, whether that's USACA, whether that's the ICC America's Caretaker Administration, whether that's USA Cricket taking over officially since then in 2018, what could have been done better in your eyes to not let that gap grow between not just USA and Thailand, but USA and, and a number of other countries like Scotland and Netherlands and some of the other teams that you came up against? Well, uh, firstly, I'll start with um, playing against Thailand. So um, we knew that Thailand is a good side, and um, we were expecting that they will be uh, tough, and they were. Um, it's just the way, uh, the professionalism that you see when they step, on, step out onto the field. Um, but they're not like, they're not super aggressive with um, words or sledging and stuff like that, but their body uh, movement, their actions on the field, the way they move towards the ball or between overs is extremely um, aggressive and professional, and um, that's what really stood out uh, for me when I watched Thailand play. Um, they never, they kind of, everyone knew their role, um, and everything seemed kind of clear in the players' heads as well. So everyone knew their role, and they were trying to execute it. Whether they executed it perfectly or not, they knew uh, what they were supposed to execute, and they did um, try. And I think that's also why um, they did so well in the tournament, and then they qualified for the World Cup for the first time. And it was it was very exciting um, as a player from an as associate nation to see Thailand play in that World Cup. Uh, it was... Um, yeah, I was I was smiling as as soon as um, especially um, the captain. He's always smiling, so it's nice to see that because um, 
when they when they played in the World Cup, they weren't just representing Thailand. In my opinion, they were re- representing the associate cricket world as well, and just um, that was good to see. And also, um, one of the players got an opportunity to play in the Women's T20 Challenge as well. And um, those are the opportunities uh, that I think full member nations or um, so-called cricket nations um, can also give to players from associate nations. Um, I know in the big women's uh, big bash, they did have a rookie player spot in each in each um, big uh, women's big bash team. Um, so we had uh, players from the Netherlands, players from Ireland and Scotland, and then uh, also from Thailand. So um, I think other associations uh, are are trying to help the associate world. Uh, what I would have liked to see from, I guess, the administrators, yes, we may not have had any ICC tournaments at the time or um, World Cup qualifications, but I think uh, we we still had a team. We had players. And um, I think bilateral series, or this is also something I continue to look forward to, are um, bilateral series or tournaments outside of the ICC structure. So now if if um, India and Sri Lanka are playing or India and England are playing or England and Australia are playing the Ashes, uh, we can, just as the men play the Audi Cup between US and Canada, we can have, I think, a lot more games. Because um, I think what's happening now is, yes, we have practice, and then we practice with the team. We have, we have uh, camps. But then... So if you take, for example, um, Sindhu and I, uh, Sindhu being uh, the captain and I'm the vice captain right now, we always end up on um, opposing teams in the national setup. And uh, whereas in w- when we represent the U.S., we have to bat together. So she bats a three, or I bat at four, or um, I open and she comes at three, or I come at three and she comes at four. So we have to bat together, but then in the national setup or in, in the domestic setup, we haven't batted together a lot at all. So that only comes about when we're playing for the U.S. and we're playing against other nations, and whether it's Canada or the Netherlands or Scotland. So as 11 or as the top 15, we haven't played a lot of cricket together as one team leading into an ICC tournament. So I think that's uh, what I would really look forward to or would have liked as well in, in the past from 2011 to um, now even, uh, just to play a lot more games for the U.S., uh, even if it's a bilateral series, or again, whether it's Argentina or Brazil or Canada or um, Netherlands or Scotland. or I know Pakistan came over um, during that time for an unofficial kind of tour. But um, just to be able to play those kinds of games, play against other international teams and um, it doesn't have to be an ICC tournament. It can be a bilateral series or um, a tri-series or something like that. One of the other things I guess I wanted to ask about in terms of your approach and kind of a varying approach possibly to to how you bat with USA versus how you bat with other teams. When you're playing in a lot of these other teams, uh, you you know, again, Susie Bates, Alex Blackwell, playing in the Tamil Nadu setup, uh, playing with Leewards, you're surrounded by really good talent, really top talent. And not to be disparaging to the USA players, but there's not the depth there in terms of, the, especially on the batting side, where a lot of the scoring is heavily dependent on two or three players. And I sense from watching on the boundary in Scotland in 2019, that, you know, compared to, to where you were as a 17-year-old, where you, you play with a lot of freedom in Bangladesh, it seemed like you were very tentative in this qualifier in Scotland, and it was very, uh, just, it, it seemed unnatural uh, for me watching you as somebody who, in my experience, has observed you as a very aggressive player, somebody who, who really likes to hit the ball, and is not concerned with just patting and tapping it and, and playing the glances yeah. and just tapping and running. And it seemed like watching from, from afar, you had it in your head, this pressure of, I can't afford to get out. I can't play, afford to play an aggressive shot because if I get out, especially like you said, if you're betting at number four, Cindy with three, 
potentially you could be the last genuine threat. And if you're at, and if you don't bat into the 19th or 20 over, that could be the difference between, you know, USA getting to 130 or 140 or, or potentially ending on 80 or 90, which happened in some games uh, for USA. So do you take a different approach when you do bet for USA, considering the level of, of uh, talent depth that is around? It's not that there aren't good players or, or quality players, it's just from, from top to bottom, on a, on a, a pure depth standpoint. It's, it's not as uh, deep as some of the other teams that you play in. So does that affect your mental approach? And does that affect the way that, that you take to batting for USA? Because, for example, when I saw somebody like, uh, on the men's side, Delray Rollins for Bermuda, Delray Rollins plays for Sussex in county cricket, and he's got a very, very different role in county yeah. cricket where he's surrounded by an incredible array of talent in, in county cricket. But when he comes to Bermuda... And when he played against USA in the T20 qualifier, it's a whole different kettle of fish. And instead of just going guns blazing, reverse sweeping from ball one like he does for Sussex and gone trying to blast everything for six, he was very, very watchful, very circumspect for a good 30, 40 balls until he felt he could really tee off in the last three or four overs. So take us through that kind of mental approach from your standpoint in terms of how you approach things in uh, other squads, per se, compared to how you approach your recent um, experiences playing for USA? Well, um, there's, a, of course, a lot of talent in the U.S. as well. And um, just, I would say, more um, experience or match play is maybe lacking. And so I'm really looking forward to how everyone comes up, especially the younger, younger generation and the younger kids, the under-19 kids. I'm really looking forward to playing with them and all of that. Um, in terms of my role, uh, I think there is a difference. I'd like to say no, I play the same way wherever <laughs> I'm playing, but definitely I think there is um, a slight difference. Or I, I, I do think subconsciously maybe that, okay, I need to stay out there. But I've noticed or I've realized that my best game is when I'm attacking. And uh, there was this game that we played against Canada. It was the third game, and um, I batted at three. And we lost an early wicket, um, but I just, I just was, I kind of felt free, and I just, uh, we'd already qualified for the, for the, um, the global qualifier. We'd won the first two games, and then the third game, I just went out there and I was just stroking the ball, and um, I hit a lot of boundaries, and it was, it was a quick fire, 30, and I think that is the game um, that kind of, I think, suits me, or. Um, yeah, that comes naturally, as you said, aggressive. I like to, I like to be a stroke maker. I like to play my strokes. So, um, there, I think there is that difference, especially um, the game, the last tournament in Scotland. Uh, whereas the previous tournament in Scotland, the 2017 qualifier, I opened the batting, so my role was slightly different. Uh, and I, I scored a 50 in that in that um, tournament in the first game. Um, it was yes, yeah, so. I, yeah, there. I think there is a difference, and um, I've, I'm working towards eliminating that difference um, and being confident enough to just uh, trust my natural aggressive stroke play, regardless of, I guess, what position um, I'm batting at or for whichever team, just to have that confidence that, yes, I will play my aggressive game, my natural game, and that will also be good for the team, and I will be able to stay longer as well with that natural aggressive stroke play. So that's, um, I think that was also my realization after the tournament that, yes, this is how I would like to play, be my aggressive self when I'm batting, and it'll also be better for the team. So, yes. Realistically, I think everybody expects USA to, to come out of the Americas as, as the champion host and the team with the most talent on paper. 50 over qualifiers is a different matter. What are the the team goals at the moment? And is it just just from a, a a very pragmatic point of view, is the team looking at that qualifier, or or you personally looking at at it as more of a development opportunity and a chance to just get exposure? Considering what you said earlier about 
just not getting enough match practice, no bilaterals, no anything. The only tournaments or the only matches that USA are playing is, is are essentially ICC events for the USA women. You're not getting those other opportunities. Considering where USA is in the rankings, considering how USA has performed against that stature of team in previous qualifiers, I don't think a whole lot of people are expecting USA to come out and, and advance in qualifying for the 50 over World Cup. So how are you approaching that? And realistically, what are your goals personally and what are your goals for the team in the home qualifier with the T20 and then also in that context, the 50 over qualifier, which is against a much, much higher standard of competition? So um, I always play to win. <laughs> so regardless of the game, regardless of the team, I, I, I'm, I'm, I always want to win. So that's what I'm looking at. But um, yeah, looking at the T20 qualifiers first, um, definitely it, I, I expect all the teams to be competitive. Um, but definitely, I think if we play as a team, uh, we can uh, win and come out on top. And we're um, also the hosts. So um, last year, we, we um, or last time we played against Canada in the T20 qualifiers, and we did well. Uh, we won, we won 3-0. But we can't expect that same result uh, this time. Uh, we, of course, as we improve, we also expect other teams to improve and also um, Yes, be really competitive. So, uh, personally, I'm just looking to play really good cricket, aggressive cricket. It's T20, so try to... Uh, I know last time we had scores around 115, 120, so um, I would think try to push that score up, 130, 140. Um, for me, personally, I've also been working on hitting sixes, so um, I, I hit a lot of boundaries, and that's been uh, kind of my game. Um, but uh, in Show us your muscles. Come on. Show us <laughs> the attacking. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in the muscles. It's, yeah, no. Um, but yeah, just working on. I've been working with a couple of coaches here in Chennai, um, coaches and players, just working on um, the different techniques and the approaches to hitting sixes and things like that. So I'd like to Im uh, bring that into my game as well to be able to uh, hit sixes at will or as required or when necessary. Say we go into a super over or something to be able to pull that out and say yes, I can do it and have that confidence. Um, so that's, um, yeah, uh, I'm just really looking forward to getting back into it and playing a lot of cricket. And it's also very exciting that Brazil and Argentina are also going to be competing this time. Um, I think that's a really good move by ICC and ICC Americas to include them um, because they are playing a lot of cricket. Uh, I would actually like to see more countries playing. And, um, yeah, it's also, I'm very glad that ICC has said that all, all T20 international, uh, all all T20s played between countries are going to be considered T20 internationals because before, uh, if you weren't, uh, you didn't have that status, it would just be an other T20. But now it's uh, uh, Austria and Germany playing five five games there. All of them were considered T20 internationals. So um, I think that's a really positive step. And uh, yes, uh, looking forward to um, the 50 over format. A lot of a lot of the girls, especially in the US. Um, haven't played 50 over cricket. At least, uh, if you look at some of the current um, squad members, some of them haven't played. Those that were there in 2011 haven't played since 2011 a, a 50 over game or um, longer formats. And uh, yeah, we've only played T20s, uh, whether it was the 2017 Scotland qualifier, the 2019 Scotland qualifier, um, or, or the one against Canada. So uh, it'll be interesting to see um, how that goes. I'm really looking forward to it. But as you mentioned, we also have a couple of full member nations that will be coming. So West Indies will be there. Uh, Sri Lanka is going to be there. Um, so uh, Pakistan will be there as well, other than the other associate nations and Bangladesh and Ireland. So it, it, I'm really looking to compete. I, I would love to surprise everyone at the qualifier by beating some of... Some of um, the bigger teams as well, and um, I think again, if we have clear roles and we do our bits well, whether it's in the field or um, executing our bowling plans and things like that, um, definitely I think we can compete and even beat some of the teams. And I'm looking forward to doing that. I personally don't believe the gap is huge or anything like that. I don't think 
um, if you take some of the teams like Australia, England, and India, uh, the gap, I would say, is much bigger. But if you look at other associate teams and um, even some uh, like ODI, uh, teams with ODI status, I do think we can compete and compete really well. Um, personally, I'm looking forward to scoring a lot of runs, a couple of 50s, maybe 100 or two, and um, taking a lot of wickets as well, and contribute to, to the team in any way that I can. I'm, yeah, I, I'd like to think, I always like to think of the team first, and um, yeah, whatever I can do to help the team, and I'm looking forward to winning some games, definitely. One other thing you just touched on there, which I don't know if it's occurred to many people, it certainly didn't occur to me, was just from a very, very basic, again, very fundamental level. You said it, USA last played 50 over cricket in 2011. That's a 10-year gap. Yes. That's, that's an entire career of not playing 50 over cricket. And again, no domestic tournaments organized by USACA, ICC America's t the Caretaker Administration Project USA, USA Cricket, literally, there has been no 50 over cricket for USA women's players. Just from a, a, a basis of match simulation, one of, again, one of, going back to one of the other things you touched on earlier about just general preparation, general skills development, just match simulation, just not even having the simulated experience of playing 50 overs, do you feel that that is a bigger obstacle to overcome rather than just the actual talent that you're going to be facing on the field, whether it's Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Ireland? That is a, that is a very big challenge, I would say, because to field for 50 overs and then to be able to even bat for 10 overs or 20 overs as a batter, it is a challenge, or for a keeper to keep for 50 overs and then have to bat, or bat and then have to keep for 50 overs, and to do that for five, six, seven games is is very challenging. And if you take Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is going to be hot as well. So that there's that added <laughs> challenge of the heat. Um, but yeah, now if we take 20 over cricket, we field for 20 overs, and then this is not just double that; it is double plus half. So. 30 more overs of fielding, and uh, it's a lot of standing and a lot of running, and more than the physical bit, it's mentally exhausting as well to be out there on the field for 50 overs. Um, and if you haven't, some of the girls haven't done that before, some of the girls haven't done it since 2011, so um, I think that is, as you rightly said, is going to be a big challenge, other than the fact that we, are, we will be facing um, good teams as well. So... Yeah, I think it comes back to our preparation, and uh, hopefully we can get some games, 50 over games, and I, I know uh, that is on the cards in the domestic structure that we will be playing um, inter-regionals and national championships, so those games, I think, should help as well. Again, just to follow up on, on that point, I guess uh, two side questions. One, if, if I go back to the 2011 tournament in Bangladesh, Looking at the scorecards against even a team just the Netherlands, not even talking about Sri Lanka, or Bangladesh, or, or Zimbabwe, but the Netherlands, in the, in the group stage match you played against them, they scored 329 for five. And then in the playoff match, they scored 293 for seven. But from memory, I remember USA being quite competitive in the first 15, 20, 25 overs where they only had about 100, maybe 110, 115 on the board. And then in those the last 20 to 25 overs, I'm looking at the scorecard now for, for the first game, where they were 166 for one after 31 overs. So they scored another 153 in the last 19 overs. And it just, from watching, I remember some of the streams, and, and USA lost that game by 225 runs. So they scored 329 for five. USA bowled out for 104. Utah scored with 19. Um, but just, it looked like, from a fitness standpoint, the team was just completely unprepared and un, 
unused, un, unsuited to it and just not not used to, not accustomed to fielding for 50 over. And it looked like they were very engaged, very alert, very enthusiastic, very energetic for the first hour, hour and a half of play. And then when those wickets weren't coming, it was like the energy just kind of fell off a cliff and they just got more and more despondent in the field and just the energy was just being to end and, and you know forget running to save boundaries the players weren't even jogging to save boundaries it was just the, once the ball left the infield or a sweeper wasn't close enough on the boundary with four or five players on the boundary it was just an automatic two if it didn't get to the rope and sometimes it would be three you know for, let alone four um so so from that same point you touched on it the do you feel like the fielding is a bigger concern because I know some people might look at it and say they're concerned that USA might not be able to bat out 50 overs if they're not used to to extending an innings or they're used to just being too aggressive. The players who are playing locally, they're, they're accustomed to playing T20 cricket. Do you are you more concerned about the fielding aspect and the fitness and, and the stamina in the field and just being able to, or is it more a case of? Um, having the, the batting uh, just uh, framework to be able to bat through an entire innings as a team? Um, so on the fielding aspect, I think it's more than um, the physical ability or the fitness. It's the concentration. Because an entire T20 game it, it is over in three and a half hours. And one innings is three hours, 10 minutes in a 50-over game. So just to be able to concentrate for 300 balls, um, each ball, just switching on and off, on and off for that, that amount of time um, is very draining mentally. Um, and to concentrate, as you said, after about an hour, an hour and a half, um, the energy levels drop. It's not, um, yes, there is a physical side to that, but I also think it's the mental how to handle that um, in terms of concentration because even a net session goes on for an hour or two hours and then that's it. We don't practice for um, three and a half hours, seven hours, whereas this game will go, go on for seven hours. So to be in the game, to be engaged is a big, big challenge. So I think that's where it goes. Even if uh, physically you're not able to, say, field 50 overs, if you're in it mentally, I think... Um, you'll you'll be fine, and after afterwards you have the ice bath and all of that to recover for the next game and um, all of that. So I think of course the support staff do a really good job of making sure we're ready, but we're also working on our fitness. And um, Bert has a good program set up for us, um, the strength as well as the conditioning, and we're doing a lot of running leading up to this. So um, I think that's also there. In the batting standpoint, I think it's more about patience. As you rightly said, especially um, in the domestic or the younger younger um, players, um, more used to being more aggressive because you only play 20 overs or maximum maybe 30 overs. And in a 50 over game, you can leave the ball, you can defend the ball more, and things like that. And to be aggressive at the right times, and um, there is a, a lot more running between the wickets as well. Um, I would say because. You, you just want to keep turning over the strike in a 50-over game as well. So um, I would say it's the mental challenge more than the physical challenge. That physical component is definitely there. But um, if you can like tune your mind in mentally uh, on how to play a 50-over game, uh, whether you're batting, bowling, or fielding, I think that will really, really help. But it is going to be a challenge because if you've never done it before, how do you... <laughs> How do you um, do it? So, um, but I think um, as, I guess, a senior player, and then of course with um, uh, the coach Pricey, uh, we'll, everyone I think will be guided, and um, yeah, we'll we'll do our best, most definitely. Just one more question on this, from your personal preparation standpoint. You're in India, you're in Chennai. I know you mentioned you've you've got some local coaches that you've had access to, but the team just had a squad camp in Texas. And for you, the personal challenges of, of trying to train with the squad in the context of the pandemic and, and ease of access to travel back and forth is posing its own set of challenges. So yes. what has it been like for you trying to get ready for this tournament 
whether it's training in India and being away from the team and, and uh, realistically when do you, do you hope to be able to join up and get playing and training with, with the uh, USA players ahead of the, the Canada, uh, Argentina, Brazil qualifier initially in September and then the Sri Lanka qualifier beyond that. Yeah, so um, I've, of course, in India there is a lot of cricket that's played, and um, the the COVID situation was bad, but it wasn't too bad the past few months. It's just gotten really bad in the past month or so. Uh, so before that, we had a lot of games. I was playing a couple of uh, I was playing for a couple of clubs here locally with the men. Um, so I've had some cricket here, and of course I was, I've been practicing uh, and all of that. Yes, I, I, I wasn't able to make it out to the camp in um, Dallas this time, but I am looking at uh, coming out to the U.S. in the next month, and I'll be there um, for any domestic matches and camps. So I'm really looking forward to getting back and um, getting back to playing with the USA Cricket. All right, now time for the first 11, the best 11. Best 11 questions, best 11 answers. you got rapid fire. Oh, no. So just gonna shoot these at you and just try and give the the first thing that comes to your mind or or the most uh, instinctive response if you can. So you ready? Ready to rock and roll? Uh, I'm not sure, but okay, we'll give it a go. <laughs> Starting off, you're the best roommate you've had on tour, whether with USA or Tamil Nadu or anywhere else that you played. Best roommate. Oh, best roommate. I don't know. In Australia, I didn't have a roommate. That was good. No. <laughs> well, for you. Well, um, yeah. No. Um, I would say um, Kamakshi. So she she was my first roommate in the senior team, and uh, uh, when I was playing for Tamil Nadu. So uh, yeah, I would say she is one of my best roommates. The messiest roommate on tour, or the the roommate who snored the loudest and kept you awake at night. That's me. I'm the messiest person <laughs> in the team usually. Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. No one actually comes across as very messy. Everyone's really neat except for me. So that would have to be. I would have to say me. <laughs> so you're the nightmare roommate. If anybody gets stuck I with am. you, that's that's Good a luck. problem. <laughs> All right. If you couldn't be a cricketer. What job would you want to do for a career? Could I be a sports broadcaster? Why not? <laughs> would you want Would you want to be a cricket broadcaster? Or would you want to be a, a sports broadcaster in a different sport mainly? Any sport. I just enjoy sports. So cricket, yes, but um, any sport really. Maybe tennis. Okay. Is Is there a I guess reason why tennis, just to follow up on that, not not part of the eleven questions, but uh, is is there something about tennis? Is it because you want to be broadcasting at Wimbledon or some other place that is a kind of a, a dream of you? Wimbledon is really nice, but I I follow tennis. I like I really enjoy watching tennis. So I watch all the uh, all the Grand Slams and I follow I follow men men and women and yeah. So I think that would be the reason. <laughs> The nicest or the best cricket ground experience you've had as a player, so not just playing, but also the training facilities and also the lunches or the teas, just the overall experience of being at a cricket ground as a player, what's the best experience you've had in your career? Sherry Bangla was an experience. That was the game against Zimbabwe. Of course, Sherry Bangla being an international stadium and then um, the lunch spread was also amazing. Not that I was really in uh, uh, we had we had batted and then we were gonna field next, so I didn't really eat much. But um, yeah, the lunch spread was was insane, and um, the dressing room, those those couches are really really comfy. <laughs> I'm sure the I'm sure the Bangladesh administrators will be delighted to hear you give them such a rave review. <laughs> okay, your favorite place to eat out on tour, fast food or otherwise, what's your go-to stop when you're, when you're on tour that you, uh, you go to, to, to refuel after an intense match or training session? Well, um, in, in, um, Florida and Fort Lauderdale, there's, uh, Woodlands. So that's South Indian food. 
So um, <laughs> that's that, that's my pick. Ring endorsement. All right for Woodlands. <laughs> Your favorite pizza topping. Cheese. Get a Does ring that endorsement. Count See, that's a, that's a trick question. Yeah. So I'm a I'm a cheese pizza guy myself. So yeah. you get no complaints from me with that answer. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a cheese pizza, cheese and tomato, or a, a margarita, as it's called yeah. in some places yeah. in the world. Are you a Coke or a Pepsi person? Coke. That's another good answer. <laughs> Ring, I'm getting the right Coca-Cola all the way. I like it. All right. Your favorite all-time cricketer? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, all-time. So I haven't had the opportunity to see him play much, but um, Gary Sobers. Just the fact that he does everything, ball pace, ball spin. Um, yes, Sir Gary Silver. What what makes you uh, just p pick him out of out of um, instead of a current player? I mean, is there have you come across footage of him, or is it just kind of the aura, the the, the myth of of Silver's and all the things that he is able to accomplish on a cricket field? I think definitely that's there, and just the fact that he's such an all rounder. Um, and to be able to hit six sixes in a in a in a long format, a five day um, game, just to have that fearless that fearlessness to do that, and the freedom and the ability as well. And the bats in those days were not as good as they are now, of course. And then, uh, yeah, he could bowl like a fast bowler, and then bowl China Man as well. Um, just that that's amazing. One of the greatest all-round cricketers. Your favorite non-cricket athlete? Serena Williams. Serena. Yes. Why Serena? She's amazing. <laughs> She's a <the> boss. <laughs> it's good enough. All right. Your favorite movie? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Well, there's seven of them. Which one? If you had to pick one of the seven. Or a seven and a half, the eight. Stone. The Sorcerer's <laughs> Stone. Yeah. It, right. it actually made me read the entire series, which is amazing because I'm not much of a reader. <laughs> well, there we go. Now we know the impact J.K. Rowling has had on on the reading development of an American cricket star. Yes, incredible. It like doubled the number of books I'd read already. No. <laughs> Last one, your favorite show to binge watch on Netflix or some other platform? Oh, favorite show. Criminal Minds. Criminal Minds. Interesting. It's a very serious show, but it was, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Good stuff. Well, that is the best 11 from Shivani Bhaskar. Uh -oh. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast. Really appreciate it. I think Thank you. it's just a fascinating journey here, and you go through all the experiences that you've had and given an opportunity for some people to relive that stuff vicariously through you, all the experiences you've had cricket and otherwise. Give you the final word. Is there anything else you want to say to American cricket fans out there about U.S. women's team, yourself, about anything else that they don't know that they that you think they should know about what lies ahead for women's cricket and for you personally? Well, uh, firstly, uh, thank you so much, Peter, for inviting me to be on your podcast. Um, I enjoy talking about cricket, and I know we've <laughs> gone quite long, <laughs> been longer than expected, but uh, yeah, it's hard to stop when you start talking about cricket and think, <laughs> think something you're really passionate about, so... Um, and uh, both of us are, and I really enjoy following um, your work, your the articles you write, or any interviews you do as well. And um, yeah, it's it's really nice, and the way you highlight um, U.S. cricket is also very encouraging for us as um, American cricketers. Um, I guess what I've realized, having played so much cricket, is you need to really enjoy it, and um, 
as long as you're enjoying it, I think uh, you'll do well. And you'll achieve what you want to achieve, um, but you have to enjoy it, and it shouldn't feel like a chore. So um, when I was playing for UWCC in Australia, Alex Blackwell's team, the coach there, um, his name is Darren Smith, um, before we went on the field, he would always say, R-E-S, relax, enjoy, and smile. So, um, yeah, even in tense situations on the field, you might see me smiling. And um, that's just because, I guess, I really enjoy the game and um, I enjoy playing. At the end of the day, it's a game and you should enjoy playing it, right? Uh, so if you're whether you play football, uh, soccer or football or something not as competitive, I think you play it because you would enjoy it, and it should be the same here. The more you enjoy it, I think the better um, you will do. Uh, that's what I've found in my many years of playing so far. So the more I enjoy that game or batting in that moment, uh, the more freedom I have and I feel uh, the better I perform. So enjoy whatever you do, I think, enjoy it. And pursue what you love. And if you love cricket, play, and it doesn't matter. Um, if you don't reach the heights that you would like to, but if you enjoy it and you're you're passionate about it, just keep at it. I think that's a brilliant message to end on. Fantastic. Shabani Bhaskar, everybody, thank you so much and good luck over the coming months in the qualifier on home soil in September and in Sri Lanka as well. Thank you so much, Peter. I'm really looking forward to all the cricket, and thanks for listening, whoever is listening, so thank you. <laughs> there are plenty of people out there who will appreciate your story for sure. Thank you so much, Peter. Well, there you have it, Shabani Bosker, everybody, formerly a long drive golfing champion. She told me she can drive it 280 yards, better than what I can do. I can max out at about 260, so she's Got quite a long drive, and she applies that to her cricket driving and cricket batting extensively as well. Powerful striker of the ball. Very exciting, dynamic player to watch for USA in the past, and certainly in the coming years as well with two tournaments on tap in the remainder of 2021. Well, that'll do it for this edition of the Stars and Stripes Cricket Podcast. Again, thank you to Shivani Bosker, and a reminder to everybody out there to subscribe on youtube subscribe on anchor fm spotify i'm peter Dalpena. thanks again stay tuned for another episode of the stars and stripes cricket podcast until then god bless america and god bless american cricket <laughs>